Thanks very much, Tom. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, as Tom said, I'm more on the sort of epidemiology public health side. But actually in Bern, we are in the process of creating a center of health sciences together with primary care and the clinical trials unit. So uh, I feel a bit at home here. So I'm going to talk to you about something that you probably know more about than I do. The problem that arises from the multitude of biases that occur on the way from designing a study, for example, a randomized control trial, performing it, and then submitting it, and publishing it, hopefully, and citing it. And along this sort of way of generating evidence, all these biases accumulate. And, of course, you know about bias due to poor methods. Uh, you know about the importance in RCTs of concealment of allocation. You know the empirical evidence that has been accumulating over recent years, or not so recent years anymore, actually, about um, the fact that trials that are not uh, concealed, um, that have not uh, randomized, allocated their participants uh, in a concealed way, that these trials tend to overestimate treatment effects in trials. But what I'm going to talk about today is really about the um, bias due to selective reporting and dissemination. So the second part um, on, on this slide. And the biases that we're talking about here are publication bias, the fact that if you have a positive result or a statistically significant result, often that study is more likely to get published than a negative study. The time lag bias, which means that positive studies are more um, swiftly, more rapidly published. Language bias, which is something that uh, we were interested in in, in Switzerland, um, and I'll show you a little, uh, uh, a few results on that, nam namely the fact that positive results tend to be um, published in English rather than, uh, in my case, in, in German or French. Multiple publication bias, positive results are more likely to be published more than once, and, of course, they're more likely to be, um, public, uh, to be cited than negative results. And there's another type of bias which is very important, um, which is outcome reporting bias. And this is a bias that really plays within the study. This is about selecting outcomes that are more exciting, um, perhaps more statistically significant, more publishable. And I'll show you some, uh, sh uh, some data about uh, outcome reporting bias. Tom already mentioned the book, which we've been trying to update um, for many years, but it's now happening, and I can promise that next year there will be a new edition of this book, and the definitions that I just gave you about all these biases are from, from that book, Systematic Reviews in Healthcare, which I edited together with Doug Altman and George Davy Smith. So let's look at some empirical data. Let's look at a conference like this one, and I can see the posters in the back, and I'm sure there's a very substantial book of abstracts. And the question arises, what's going to happen with these abstracts? Are they going to get published in full so that they can be fully appraised and perhaps included in a systematic review or meta-analysis? Now, when you look at these numerous studies that have been done on that question, and you synthesize that evidence, as has been done by uh, colleagues from the Cochrane Collaboration, then you see that if it's an RCT overall, and there's some differences across disciplines, I don't know where general practice exactly is in that um, range, but overall about 60% of randomized controlled trials that were presented as an abstract at the conference uh, will be published, and you see that it takes quite a long time. You see we're talking about 100 months until we, or close to 100, until we reach that 60%. The non-RCT studies, observational studies, have a lower rate of making it into a full paper. Uh, we just get to uh, 50% there. 
Now, why does this matter? It matters for the reason that I already mentioned, namely that this is not a random process. Um, it wouldn't matter if you, know, you, you did all these studies and randomly some get published and some don't, but this is not the case. The statistical significance of the positive outcome versus a not very positive outcome on this slide is associated with full publication. And this, of course, means that you get a distorted um, view of all the evidence when you look at the published um, uh, abstracts compared to all the abstracts. And, of course, a negative study um, is as important as a positive one. Um, a better way to look at publication bias is not to go to conferences like um, this one, but to actually go to the very beginning to the ethics committees or institutional review boards where people submit the studies they um, want to do. So you don't have that selection of into acceptance at the conference, which of course people have shown also to be um, associated with uh, positive results. So there are quite a few such studies and you see the ethics committee um, listed on, on this slide. Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, actually had two cohorts of uh, studies submitted um, because they have uh, public health and a clinical medicine ethics committee, then the Oxford, central Oxford um, uh, research Ethics Committee, the Sydney Committee and the French um, National and the Spain National Ethics Committee and in Bern we did a study um, with the Cantonal uh, Registry and you see the proportion published sort of ranges from 65% in the States down to 31% in Spain and again this wouldn't be really a problem if it wasn't associated with the statistical um, significance of uh, the results of these uh, studies. And you see a little meta-analysis, a random effects meta-analysis, for those who are interested, which shows that the odds of having your study published um, is 2.6 higher if the result is uh, statistically significant. And again, there were quite a few years of follow-up. Um, you see Johns Hopkins, about eight years of follow-up. Um, so there was ample opportunity to get these studies published. Now, the other really important issue is the within-study uh, selection bias when you choose your outcomes. And there have been several studies on this. What I'm showing you on this slide is a study that we did um, again in, uh, in, in Bern. And uh, we looked at... Uh, proposals submitted to the local uh, ethics committee, and this was actually the largest study that had, had, had ever been done um, with uh, sort of two, two and a half thousand outcomes uh, included. And what you see on this table is the definition in the study protocol. So it can be a primary outcome or a secondary outcome, or it can be not defined, and then the outcomes reported in the publications. And of course, what you should see is that the primary outcome in the study protocol in 100% corresponds to the primary outcome in the publication. But that is not so. Um, as you see, um, concordant, so one here and one here, primary here and primary here, um, was observed in only 61%. And the other uh, 40 or so percent, um, you see a primary outcome became a secondary outcome, um, or um, a, a primary outcome was newly defined. It didn't exist in the protocol, um, but it sort of magically emerged um, and became a primary outcome in the publication without even having been mentioned in the study protocol. So th this goes on. This is uh, part of the reality of clinical research. Um, and we are reading all these papers, but we rarely actually read the study protocol. We don't know whether what people describe as the primary outcome is really the primary outcome in 
uh, in the study protocol, although there are some improvements and I will uh, talk about these uh, briefly in a minute. The sort of result, perhaps, of all these accumulating um, biases is that uh, when you look, and this is a very recent uh, publication in, in JAMA, in Internal Medicine, looking at outcomes of studies on interventional cardiology devices by industry affiliation of authors. So basically they looked at whether the co-authors were from industry, at least one, or whether there were, you know, no industry uh, affiliated, uh, no industry employee authors. And what you see is that uh, if industry was involved uh, in an authorship, the, um, that's the, the blue bar, that the results tended to be more positive, and this was particularly uh, pronounced for randomized controlled uh, trials, whereas it wasn't really, there wasn't a big difference for uh, uh, registry uh, studies of these uh, cardiology devices. So, I mean, we've been talking about this for many years, and people have taken notice. People have, editors have written many editorials about it, and they have proposed some solutions. Now, the first solution that has been proposed was reporting guidelines. And I've been involved, and it's, it's been great fun to develop these guidelines because you lo learn a lot. You almost do your MSc in epidemiology again by helping to, for example, develop the consort guidelines or the, the strobe guidelines. So these are the main uh, guidelines are, are, are sort of listed here. And you see randomized trials is consort, observational studies, that's case control studies, cohort studies, and cross-sectional studies, strobe, systematic reviews, PRISMA, case reports, qualitative research, also very important, diagnostic, prognostic studies, etc. But do note that there are another 319 reporting guidelines out there for this or that and, and the other. And just last month, two new guidelines have been published, um, and that's the Gather Statement, um, which is an initiative uh, by the Health Metrics uh, Institute in, in, uh, in Seattle, uh, Chris Murray, and the World Health Organization. And that's basically about um, helping people to report estimates on prevalences, for example, of disease or risk factors and incidences appropriately, so that they can be used in, for example, the global burden of disease study. Um, and another initiative that I was involved in was an extension to the strobe um, statement for nutritional epidemiology, which is, of course, uh, an area of epidemiology where you really have a lot of uh, measurement issues, etc. And the other major initiative was, of course, the establishment of trial registries. And the 18th of September uh, 2004, now more than um, 10 years ago, was really quite a day because these big journals, JAMA, Lancet, BMJ, they announced that they will no longer publish trials if they have not been registered in a trials uh, registry. Um, compulsory re registration of clinical trials. And they must be registered, they said, at or before the onset of enrollment to be considered for publication in those journals. These are heroes, these editors. They are changing the world. And this initiative really created a lot of enthusiasm and that we will now solve the problem of publication bias because all the trials will be registered. And, of course, the problem was that many different registries were set up. Um, so, for example, in my country, Roche has a registry, 
and Novartis has a registry. And many countries, the Netherlands, have a registry. And there's a big mess in terms of the number of registries that people should you know, search in order to actually um, make full use of this information. And the World Health Organization has reacted to this situation by creating a international clinical trials registry platform, which is extremely useful. And of course, many, many people, including many Swiss investigators, um, have their trials registered uh, at clinicaltrials.gov, uh, the US registry. I did note that the Irish Pharmaceutical Healthcare Association, this is the Irish Association of Pharmaceutical Companies, they are aligned with the Federation uh, of uh, Pharmaceutical Company uh, registers. But as I said, many companies have their own registry. So the question now is, has this worked? These reporting guidelines and these trial registries, what have they achieved? And I think it's a good moment to look at that because the consort statement was originally for the first time published sort of mid of the 90s. And as we've just seen, the trial registry initiative is now uh, also more than 10 years old. And I've done a little literature search uh, to look at empirical studies that looked at the impact that these initiatives had. So there is a um, Cochrane review on the question whether endorsing the consort statement, so endorsement by the journal where a trial is published, um, is associated with a more complete reporting of um, that trial. And I'm just showing you, uh, you know the consort statement includes, I can't remember, perhaps 18 items, but one of the most important ones, and em empirically um, very strongly supported uh, items, is allocation concealment. And this is the, the forest plot, the meta-analysis, um, comparing um, journals that endorse um, consort with journals that don't, and you do see a clear trend, or actually more than a trend, um, that the journals that have officially endorsed consort um, do publish trials that are more complete in terms of reporting on how exactly um, concealment of allocation was, was done. However, I mean, look at this. It's still a minority. Even in the journals that endorse consort, it's overall 45% of these trials actually have adequate reporting. Um, this is a few years ago. You could say it, it may be a bit better now, but I'm disappointed. And I'm, of course, also very disappointed <laughs> about the 22%, um, but you can say, okay, these are journals that do not endorse consort, so I shouldn't be too surprised. Now, what about compliance with prospective trial registration? Now, this is an interesting, um, very recent uh, study, actually a few weeks old, um, which did a cross-sectional analysis of all articles uh, reporting trial results published in the six highest impact general medicine journals that were sort of the signatories to that 2004 statement. And I did call them in 2004 heroic. I'm not sure what I'm going to call them today, but the fact is that about almost a third, 28% of articles that they published did not comply with the um, International Council of Medical Journal Editors Policy, which, as I said, was announced with a big fanfare in 2004. They were retrospectively registered. And in some of these trials, it was possible that things, you know, had changed. So, again, I'm disappointed because the editors actually don't adhere to 
their own guidelines and they don't check these things thoroughly and it's possible for quite a substantial number of trials to slip through um, the system. And of course, registration doesn't mean that these trials are then published. So this is a, a study, again, quite recent, um, which showed that a quarter of phase three, so very relevant uh, clinical trials uh, of, of uh, pediatric epilepsy, um, still remain unpublished. So registration doesn't mean that the full uh, data set or the full results actually become available. It, it helps because you know this trial has been done, you can make an effort to get the results, but of course, again, it is disappointing that still so many trials, even if registered, then are not, and these are clinical trials, um, are then not, not, not published. So, has it worked? <sighs> not really. Not to the extent I would have hoped, I have to say. But perhaps other disciplines have done a better job at that. Um, because, of course, these problems, um, for example, of publication bias, they're not unique to medical research. They are, for example, also very prevalent in psychology. So this is your academic psychologist. And you see he's fishing for a p-value. <laughs> he's, got, he's got his data well locked up. Um, because some of it he doesn't want to publish, um, probably because it's negative. And also, he doesn't want to share the data because there's no incentive. And in psychology, they have two very nice words which I like a lot. Hark and p-hacking. P-hacking is what we call selective outcome reporting. It's basically, but you know, psychologists do a lot of correlations and they get these huge tables with p-values and there's a lot of hacking going on in terms of what is then um, published. But also hark is very important and I do think also relevant to, uh, to medicine. Hypothesizing after results are known. Hark. And I think it's something that possibly I and other people in this room have done uh, in their professional life. And of course, publication bias. So, why is this happening? Probably in almost all or many disciplines of science. It's happening because we place a lot of importance on the results of a study or an experiment in psychology, and not enough on the processes that produce them. It's the results that get you a Lancet paper. The same study that would have shown another uh, less exciting, less positive, would go in another journal or remain unpublished, and that is still the case today. Results make science exciting, but judging the quality of science and of scientists according to the results is bad science. Science has an incentive problem. What is best for science is not necessarily best for the scientist who wants to advance in his or her career. High quality research regardless of outcome is good science. Producing a lot of publishable results is good for scientists. And of course, what's best for patients is also high quality research regardless of outcome. So, Chris Chambers, who is a uh, psychologist based uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Cardiff, not so far away from here, across the water, he makes a new proposal, and again, it's heroic. He's basically proposing that there should be a registered reports model to publishing. So, researchers decide on their hypothesis, obviously, they do their experimental, they write down their experimental procedures, but don't do them, 
and main, uh, they, they, they describe the main analyses before data collection. And they put this in a paper, which will have an introduction and um, a methods section with an analysis plan, etc. And then they submit this for peer review. And the peer review basically decides whether this is a good study. And if it is a good study and the peer reviewers agree, then that paper is essentially accepted for publication. Okay? And will then obviously submit it with the full results. And several journals um, have, have uh, accepted this model now in psychology, including his journal, which is Cortex. I mean, he's a, a brain research imaging guy. He's not the classical psychologist in that, in that sense, and this is, this is a fairly important journal. Um, in the sense, it is important that it sort of verges into biomedicine. I'm not, I'm not wanting to say that other branches of psychology uh, are, not, are not important. Um, so, the beauty of this idea is that it doesn't matter whether the p-value is statistically significant. It doesn't matter whether the results are particularly novel, because as we, as we know, rep replication in science is extremely important. But no one is very interested in doing it, because the incentive isn't there. And, of course, it doesn't matter whether the hypothesis is supported or not. Um, of course, this is not a new idea. And uh, Rosenthal from the University of California, who, who is famous, uh, I think he's probably one of the first to talk about publication bias, and he called it the file drawer problem, that you basically have a file drawer <laughs> where you put all the negative results and you keep it well shut. Um, so he was saying um, that basically if, if what, what, what we need is a system for evaluating research based only on the procedures rather than the results. And, and as I said, the problem is that the results are really very important and, and the procedures and the methods. Often what I observe is that a first study that has shown something methodologically is often weak. But because the results are so interesting, it gets into a top journal. And the very good studies that follow, that are actually better than the first one, do not make it into the top journal because they're replicating. But they're often methodologically better than the first study. So my question to you now is, will it work? And I really hope we can have a discussion about um, what I've been putting to you, but if you look at Chris Chambers' article in The Guardian, in the science section, um, he lists a quite substantial, uh, well, certainly he lists a number of journals who have uh, uh, decided to come on board, um, including, for example, Social Psychology, Stress and Health, uh, European Journal of Neuroscience. So they all now have a section uh, on uh, reports that are um, in that model that, that Chris is, uh, is, uh, is uh, suggesting. And with that, um, I will end and obviously acknowledge him because it's his idea and not mine. And with that, I hope we can have a little bit of discussion, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Um, so I think we've got about 10 minutes for discussion and we're very, Matthias, very keen to discuss uh, and I think there's lots of people who have um, opinions about and suggestions. So um, I think there's two microphones and so if you could identify who you are and then we'll kick off. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Diane Kelso. I'm the editor of the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the talk. It was, uh, it resonated very much with me. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the issue about clinical trial registration, and you showed numbers that say how many trials are published um, with retrospective registration. This is a plea from an editor for people who do RCTs. We often get requests with the, we had administrative problems. That's why we couldn't get it registered. 
And um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a month and we go, okay, a month. But sometimes we get that plea with 13 months, 18 months, they haven't registered. So just a comment, you know, if you're doing an RCT, think registration, do it before you start. I, I also really like the idea of, um, we've really gotten into publishing protocols um, in CMAJ Open. Um, and because that's, I mean, sort of a version of the, we don't guarantee the publication, but that's another great idea to get really good feedback on your protocol, get that peer review so you can fix it, which will increase the likelihood it'll get published. Thank you. Why don't you guarantee publication? Well, this is a new this thought. This is the really this is a This is a good thought, and, yeah. and I'm going to, absolutely, I'm going to think about that, because certainly um, one of the issues um, is, um, you know, again, the whole concept of research waste. You know, we have um, in CMAJ Open, we'll publish articles that are methodologically sound. Then we go to meetings on research waste, and it's like, well, it's methodologically sound, but it's not advancing the discipline. So there is always that tricky bit. Um, but I do like the idea of guaranteeing publication, so I will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. I think the whole point about the idea is that you judge the soundness of the methodology before the results become available. Yes, so, yeah. exactly. Thank you. I guess it's a really comment about the REF system and the incentives that that has. Did you just say you are? Sorry. Sorry. Francis Mayer from Glasgow. Um, and they, one of the things that gets you a four-star paper is the novelty. So rigor is also really important, but it's the novelty. So replication, um, probably less well. I, I wondered if you'd like to comment on that. Well, I mean, you, you probably know the paper that John Ionidis uh, wrote about how, um, you know, the majority of all the results are false. And the reply by Jan van den Brucke, who showed that if, you know, if you replicate, then you come to um, a much more sound assessment of what's probably going on. So replication is extremely important. And in Chris Chambers' model, it doesn't matter whether the novelty is basically not an issue. But of course, journals are also enterprises. They need uh, press attention. They need, you know, they. They don't work, they don't function like that. So I, I can't see the big journals subscribing to that. Roger Jones, I'm the editor of the British Journal of General Practice. Thank you very much for your talk. I should warn you, there are a number of psychologists in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that The Lancet tried that pre-registration thing. Ian, Ian Chalmers, I think, devised the idea 15 or 20 years ago. And I'm pretty sure that for a while, the Lancet peer review protocols and guaranteed publications, but I think they've stopped doing it. Yeah, I think the that Lancet... Wasn't, that's not my question, but that's just a For some time, I don't know whether they still do that. Yeah, but they, you they, can they did actually do it, because yeah. we sent a... Uh, and they accepted the pub, uh, protocol mm -hmm. and then didn't publish the trial, and we published the trial yeah. in the BMJ. Mm -hmm. So I think your point about journals' priorities took over then, it wasn't mm -hmm. sexy enough for them, albeit it was a reasonably well-done randomised mm -hmm. trial. I, I think if you don't promise authors that after yeah. you've reviewed the protocol that you will actually publish, yeah. then what's the point? Then they might as well just send in, yeah. send in the, the papers with the results. Yeah. So it, it sort of defies the object of, of yeah. that, that, that underlying idea, that yeah. methods first and then results. Yeah. But what I wanted to get you to talk about a bit was peer review. You mentioned it briefly. To, to get peer reviews of protocols and then to peer review the article, whether or not you've offered public, guaranteed publication, places a, quite a big burden on the pool of peer reviewers. I think there are some issues there about resources. But I also wondered whether you think that peer review and different forms of peer review have a role in dealing with some of these problems with bias that you've already alluded to. You know, so open versus closed, transparent versus anonymous peer review. Do you want to reply? Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm not sure whether I got your question exactly, but but I think the really the really fundamental issue is that you just look at the methods and the procedures, and based on that, you make the decision whether you accept the paper. And the Lancet gave the promise that they would review the paper if they liked the protocol, but then they had a very high rejection rate. Actually, I had Richard Horton once tell me at the conference, I will publish your paper, and he then rejected it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, yeah. Can't trust, you can't trust editors. 
I mean, I think uh, to, to, to Roger's point is about what's the onus. Mm -hmm. We're all peer reviewers. Mm -hmm. Many of us have been editors or associate editors. What's the onus on us to implement things like cons or standardised reporting guidelines? I mean, I teach the students in our postgraduate training that you should use them as a, a way in which to do better research, but also use them to do uh, to be a better peer reviewer. And I guess how far can you push that as an issue? Yeah, I mean, I think these reporting guidelines are extremely useful, and also the trial registries. I, I've reviewed trials, and I went back to the, the record in the trial registries, and I did realise that the outcome had changed. And I then, of course, incorporated that in my review um, report. But, but I think the fundamental problem really is that the incentives are wrong. As Chris Chambers very clearly said, that basically, as a scientist, as a career scientist, you, you have to play the game in order to advance. And these um, initiatives are just subverted by that extremely strong force uh, that is, that is at, 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 at work due to these wrong incentives. And I think if we can't change that, I'm pretty pessimistic that we will you know, completely solve this problem. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry to be a bit messy. Yeah. Simon, do you want to um, you, Simon Griffin from Cambridge, you focused on trials, but much of healthcare and health policy is informed by or even directed by observational studies. So I sometimes look at the nurses' health study and think people pick a random exposure and a random outcome until they get the small p-value. So your approach wouldn't work for that because you'd actually have to pre-register every single PhD student hypothesis and analysis plan in order to overcome the p-hacking of observational studies. Yeah, I, I think the situation with observational research and particularly with large cohort studies that have measured many, many things and have added on things as they went along is perhaps more close to the psychology situation. Um, that I talked about briefly. Um, of course, you would expect, if this mo model uh, is supposed to work, that the analyses haven't been done. <laughs> you know, there's a big temptation to basically submit into this pipeline what you already know is probably going to come out as interesting. And uh, So I take your point, but the same applies to, to psychology, and this is a discussion they are having. Uh, to what extent you could trust what is coming in is really pre um, you know, uh, is, is really pre-registration and pre-analysis. So it's worse, you know, in, the situation is worse, I think, than, than with RCTs. Yeah. Uh, Katie Donnell from Glasgow, thank you. Enjoyed that so much. Um, this is a comment, perhaps more for editors in the hall than for yourself. Uh, but as a PI, I really like the idea of the, the pre-publishing. But if I'm going to be asked to pay a thousand pounds or more in author processing charges now, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to hold that money, which is a limited pot of money for the results-driven uh, papers. So how do we get around that issue now? Okay, um, because you have to pay for the the open access publication. Yeah, um, and this this is a real is a real issue. And uh, what is interesting is just about two days ago, the the Wellcome Trust announced that they will team up with Faculty 1000 to create their own journal. They already have a journal, eLife, but now they're going to create a journal for their grantees where their grantees can publish for free. Um, so they basically, um, you know, solve your problem if you have a grant from the Wellcome Trust. And my comment on that is everyone should be doing this, all funders, should make sure that people don't face the problem that you're facing. But the Wellcome Trust have, has listened to you and uh, is implementing it. Just two more questions then. Hi there, Nero Thurie-Wardner from the University of Lincoln. Thank you for a great talk. Um, a, qu a question from me is, uh, in, in relation to all of the protocols that have been published now, do you think that um, the quality of the RCTs being designed in these published protocols better and um, in terms of delay to publication um, it would be interesting but worrying if uh, you know poor poor uh, publications 
with positive results got published quicker than good, you know, good methodologies, uh, but with negative results. So just, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that is, that is worrying. Um, and and it, it can be empirically shown that it's happening. You know, to what extent it's really going to affect, in a given situation, the recommendations that follow, for example, from a guideline, is difficult to predict. But that tendency is definitely there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, it's Paul Little from Southampton. So, um, I, I think you will struggle to get around the problem of trials being uh, reported fully until all of the funders, as the HTA do, require a report. Now, I think that should be done flexibly because anybody who's done an HTA report knows what a pain in the butt it is. But um, that absolute requirement has converted it from 60% to 100%. 100% of all of the HTA trials are, are reported in some form or another, whether they failed or not. So I think you need to go to the funders um, to actually uh, start to solve this. I, I agree, and uh, John Biden, the still um, vice president of the US has actually threatened the oncology community in the US with uh, funding cuts if they carry on not publishing their, their, their trials. So John Biden is actually saying, now you have to publish your trials, <laughs> otherwise we will cut you funding. Yeah. That is also helpful. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how the HDA do it. If you don't yeah. if you give us a report, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get any more money. Okay, well, thank you. That was a, a great discussion. I, I just want to thank, in the usual way, Matthias, for a very interesting and inspiring talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>